I'm Jennifer Shahadi, and today we're going to look at teachable moments from the clutch game of the Women's World Chess Championship. But first, let's check in with little Bobby so he can tell us what happened. The Women's World Championship is over now. Guess who won? And... And come on, Bobby, you got it. Ju and Ju. Nice, yes, Ju and Ju. How do you know that? Because I watched it. The tension is rising. The excitement is just pumping through my veins, Jen. I can't wait. I think it's just going to be one of those games where it's pretty safe, but if Ju Wen Jun finds an opportunity, she will pounce. And there we have it, yeah. D4, D5. I wanted to focus on the final game. But let's take a quick look at the penultimate game as well. Just the opening, because it ties into something I'm going to talk about a lot in game 12. So game 11, Lei Tingche, the challenger, had the white pieces. And as usual, she plays the move E4. Well, I mean, what is there to say about Lei Tingche? She is a fantastic player and a fantastic personality. Amazing expressions, funny witticisms in the press conference. Um, so... I'm definitely a huge fan of her now, uh, but as Fabian indicated, she did not win the World Championship this time, but maybe she'll be back. Um, in this game, we saw a Joko piano. So game 11, her last white was a Joko. Ju Wen Jun throughout the match played all sorts of interesting openings against E4. She tried the Caro, she tried the Sicilian, but mostly double King Pawn. And we see here that after the Joko, uh, Ju and Jun elected to play bishop b7. Now, why am I showing you this opening? Because it's something very important for little kids or for new players of all ages, is this question, what do you do when your opponent plays knight g5? Well, I can tell you that's an even harder question when the bishop's not yet on e7, which leads to the fried liver type positions. Um, for instance, in this position, after knight f6, knight g5 immediately, very testing move. But the big difference is that once you've got this bishop developed, whether it's on e7 or c5, it's actually pretty easy to meet knight, meet knight g5 because, that's right, you can simply castle. And then after knight takes f7, rook takes f7, bishop takes f7, king takes f7. Well, let's check in again on little Fabi about this one. I got a rook and a pawn, you got a bishop and a knight. How do you evaluate that trade? Who got a better trade? Mm -hmm. Who got more? Why did you get more? Why do you think you got more? Because in the opening of the second knight better than the pawn. Ah, because rook But and... knights are not better than a pawn and a, than a rook, but a rook and a pawn, a knight and a bishop are better, but a knight is not better than a rook. But in, the, but in the end game, we're working upon it really good. So in the end game, it might be pretty close. So why do I bring that up? Because this imbalance, which is actually one of my favorite imbalances, I talk about that in the Perpetual Chess Podcast with Ben Johnson as we recap this match there as well. Check it out if you haven't already. I'll put a link in the show notes. We talked about this imbalance in game 12 quite a bit. You know, two pieces in the case of game 12 ended up being two knights for a rook and a pawn. A very important imbalance and one that I've always been fascinated by and one that children are fascinated by. In fact, I feel like in many ways because of this very sequence, it's the first imbalance that kids are introduced to. And it kind of forces them to get out of the mindset of pure materialism and counting points. Because if you just count points, it looks like an even trade. But as Fabian indicated, it's not really an even trade. Um, you know, I've had to explain it to him a few times, but I, I think he gets it now. Like giving up that bishop and that knight uh, is too much. It's not just about the material. It's about the type of position and it's about the tempo that white gave up playing knight f3, knight g5, bishop c4, bishop takes f7 that really makes black the winner in this trade. So keep that in mind as we move on to game 12 because I think what game 12 showed me is how deep Ju Wen Jun's understanding of positions are. And I was really fooled by my understanding of this imbalance and blown away 
by what Ju Wen Jun taught me about it. So my favorite imbalance has become even more favorite. <laughs> more favorite? That's kind of a thing, right? So let's get into it. Game 12. It's for all the marbles. Ju Wen Jun, Lei Ting Che are tied up. Whoever wins will become the women's world champion. Well, in Ju Wen Jun's case, she stays world champion. The queen stays the queen. But there's also another wrinkle. If there's a draw, and hey, when two grandmasters play in such a hotly contested match, a lot of times it's going to be a draw, there's a playoff, a rapid and blitz playoff. And that's what both me and my co-commentator on chess.com for those final two rounds thought was going to happen. We thought for sure there was going to be a wild playoff. But Juwen Jun had another idea in mind. So after d4, d5, knight of three, knight of six, e3, I really thought there was going to be a draw because this is the Kali opening. And I don't know, from my e4 point of view, it looks pretty dry. Grunfeld, I love. I love the King's Indian, even though I don't play it. But this one, I was like, okay, this is just an indication it's going to be a quick draw. Well, hold your horses as <laughs> within just a few moves, um, I was completely dispelled of that notion as the position just totally blew up, right? So it actually became extremely imbalanced. Um, in particular, we see this imbalance where white has the connected past pawn while black has a beautiful center. So there's a lot of dynamics behind that. In fact, um, during the game, we talked about this possibility of just breaking things open with this bizarre looking move, G5, um, just going for it, right? Um, if knight takes g5, there'd be a rook g8. Um, okay, that didn't happen. Lei Ting Che played a little bit more sedate than that. But nonetheless, the position was very aggressive for both sides. So you see this bishop-queen battery is really going to keep white on her toes. And she still has to contend with other types of center central expansion ideas like c4, threatening a fork, or even e5 at some moment. So not an easy position to play for either side. And I mean, I'm sure for anyone watching this, you can't believe it's easy for black to play this position because you're staring at these pawns, right? You always got to be on your toes. You look the other way for just a minute and suddenly the pawns are on B7 and A6 and you're done for, right? So really requires a lot of care. And I have to say, by the time we got to this position, I no longer thought we were definitely going to have a playoff. At this point, I was like, okay, I changed my line to 50-50, but let's see what happens. After rook c8, queen c2, c4, threatening um, the fork c3, bishop and knight action there. So we saw bishop to c3 blockading um, the pawn, and I'll keep that idea in mind because this c3 square became a really important square for the game, and you'll see that Ju and Ju made a number of good moves on that square. After knight c5, a5, I mean, that was kind of the point of this move, that when we have the bishop on c3, not only does it stop the pawn from coming forward, but it also supports our pawn. And that's something you see from great players, and you'll see from yourself as you improve, that it's all about trying to do multiple things with all of your moves, or with many of them, right? The, the term double attack gets a lot of attention, but a lot of times it's not just about a double attack. It's about a move that attacks and defends at the same time. Maybe a move that defends two things at the same time. Maybe a move that develops and attacks at the same time. So I want you to kind of expand your idea of double to not just be about double attack, but just about dual purpose, right? Because it's, it's really an important idea. And a uh, commentator and legendary grandmaster I worked with for many years, Yasser Sarwan, himself said that he believes every tactic in chess is some kind of form of double attack. And while, you know, that's a great philosophical point to ponder when you think about tactics, it is true that most good chess moves have more than one thing going for them. So keep that in mind. Now, after knight to b3, white does have to be a little careful, right? Because if we simply take on b3, we're going to be in deep trouble, right? After pawn takes b3, look at that bishop on c3. It's going to go bye-bye. Although, even in that case, we'll have a tiny bit of comp because we've got these two pawns, but not enough. So 
Of course, uh, that was not at all what Ju and June had in mind. But she did surprise me with that move. I think Jovi and I were expecting something like rook to a2 or rook to a4. But she played bishop takes f6. Okay. Because now, if you simply play pawn takes f6, now we can take on b3, right? There's no more hanging piece on c3. And so this would be just crutching for white. Now we've got an extra pawn, but look at what a pawn it is. Um, well, I mean, you can't play rook a5 that easily because there's b6, right? And obviously you can't go to a7 because of the pawn. You don't have time to take on a1. So you'd be forced to play queen c5, but now the pawn is really looking like a runaway. And even though the material is technically equal, you cannot count this pawn as much as this pawn. <laughs> that, a pawn is not just a pawn. This is a super pawn. And this pawn has very little hope. I'm sorry. I like pawns, but you don't have a lot of hope over there, F6. <laughs> so in this case, white would have been totally crushing. So bishop takes F6. Obvious move to look at, but, you know, there's one clear concern. Black could play knight takes A1. And that is what black did. Now, after bishop takes A1, you don't want to take with a rook, right? Because then... Black will take this bishop on f6 and suddenly be up material, right? So even though we might have a chance to get a little bit of compensation with b6, it's not what Ju Wen Jun had in mind. So instead, she took with the bishop. Negative doesn't protect this pawn, right? So that pawn's gonna go bye bye. Positive, we've switched back. So I like to call this the switch back. So we attack a piece. You attack one of our pieces, and then we use the piece that was in take from the capture before to capture your piece. I call it a switchback because what I just said took like three sentences, <laughs> okay? It took at least one very long sentence, whereas switchback is just two words. So when you do that, it's usually really beneficial for you because you were able to save a piece and get a piece. In this particular case, what we see for white is that we've got two pieces, and our opponent is going to have a rook and a pawn. That very same imbalance that I was talking about with Bobby from the iconic position that, you know, kindergartners, new players, first graders, you know, at any age, honestly, it's not about age, it's about how long you've played chess. You kind of get into that position with the knight on g5 and the bishop c4, and you're like, well, is this good or not? You learn about this imbalance the two pieces versus the rook and the pawn. But here it is in the top of the world in the contest for the Women's World Chess Championship crown. And now we have to ask ourselves, who do we like and why? Well, I'll tell you when I saw this position and we were analyzing it with the OV, I, I was very confident that I would have preferred white, but I was also very confident of one thing. I did not want to trade queens because I'm like, I'm white here and the minor pieces are really good at attacking, right? So let's keep queens on the board and try to checkmate Lei Ting Chek. I mean, speaking of checkmating, let's just do it right away. And by the way, this is also an engine approved move, knight g5. But it, to me, it also really spoke to the logic of the position that you've got these minors and I thought it was a battle of ideas where I would be trying to checkmate you and you would be desperately trying to trade queens, right? So like in this position, I would play bishop c3, you would play queen a2, I would play queen d1, and you know try to transfer my queen. Um, maybe queen a2 was not the best move, but you see my point. Like I thought that this would be like an interesting battle of ideas where black would maybe take this pawn instead and, and say, well, how are you gonna transfer this queen? Because queen d1, it's kind of a long-winded plan, right? Maybe I can um, break through and start pushing the C pawn before you get a chance to transfer your queen. That battle of ideas made me think, whoa, this is definitely gonna be a decisive game. And as I was considering all that, Jun and Jun made a move that I did not expect at all. She played queen to C3 offering a trade of queens in a position where I thought she wanted to keep queens on the board. But she had deeply thought about the position and believed that she was going to be able 
to have a big advantage in this line, or at least some kind of advantage that she could work with. And it was, it was quite interesting to see because of my perception that White so heavily wanted to keep queens on the board. And I think that's something about modern chess that the better you are, the more it's about the demands of the specific position and less about your preconceived notion about what you want to do. It's always a combination, but you do notice that that concrete ideas tend to become more important um, the better you get. So anyway, queen c3 more or less forces a trade of queens because we're finding queen takes g7 checkmate. So queen takes c3 was the move. And then after bishop c3, rook b8, I mean, of course, this pawn is a menace to black society here. I mean, it's a menace to her race for the crown, let's put it that way. So knight to d4 was played, protecting that pawn. And now we see the move e5. And this move was widely um, condemned as a blunder, but you have to sympathize with Lei Ting Jae here. I mean, come on, this pawn looks so strong. Wouldn't you want to get rid of it also? I mean, I get it, right? I mean, let's let's say goodbye to B baby. It's a dangerous pawn. Um, and for instance, if White plays something like Knight C6, I mean, Rook B5 is sitting very, very pretty because. You know, knight e5, there's rook a3, and suddenly, um, yeah, we're getting a lot of activity with all of our pieces here, right? You know, bishop d4, we have c3 banging through. So I can totally understand why Lei Tingxie thought that this might be a good idea. Now, I'm sure she saw the move knight f5, which is what um, Jun Jun played. But after knight f5, her plan was to simply play bishop f8. And I mean, anything else is terrible, right? Because otherwise you lose more stuff. Like if you play bishop e7, there's knight e7 check, forking the pawn. And then sure, you only win one pawn, but then you attack this and you're probably going to lose this or I'm going to keep this. Just to give you an idea, I'll just actually show it to you. So here we're attacking this. And when you move it, we can play b6 and now you know you didn't even get my b pawn which is kind of the whole point of you playing e5 right so uh to say the least that did not turn out well for black instead you play bishop anywhere else well we take this and we also attack g7 yikes so bishop f8 is only move bishop takes e5 played and now rook takes b5 i'm late she achieves her goal and gets the beautiful B pawn, but at what cost? G4, the first of many gorgeous positional moves. You know, G4 is a move that you might be more used to seeing in a middle game. Like, let's meet our opponent, but watch carefully. When you look at the games of great positional grandmasters, you'll see they play moves like this a lot. It's about gaining space in the end game, not only for your pieces, but to restrict your opponent from doing the same. And also, remember we talked about in my recent video, the chess ball video, where my opponent played the move knight f3. We talked about creating a kind of like a fort for your king in the end game. And this does that really well, too. Like, you can imagine a king hopping to g3 and being very comfortable. So g6 was played. Now knight d4 is move the knight away. And now after rook b2, we reach a really key position. Think about what you would do. And let's move over to Fabi and see what he would do. When Jun and Jun played this move, even though it's a backward move, and usually you like to move your pieces forward, why is it such a good move? Why? Why do you think? Because the rook can take him and will protect him. Yeah, so you're not worried about that. But why else is it a good move? Where does the knight want to go? Yeah. So what was the point of this move might be one? To ba 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 move it into two squares so it might be here. And why is that a good move? I don't know, but it's a good move. Candy, candy. I said that when the rooks and the pawns are together, they can sometimes be really good, but now the knight does what? But in addition to blocking the pawn, what else does it do? It doesn't just block the pawn, it also attacks which pawn? It attacks this pawn! It attacks this pawn! It attacks the pawn! It attacks the pawn! Yeah, good. Candyland! 
All right. Well, you can see you got very excited by that. And you know what? Ju and Jun was excited by that too, because in the press conference, she pointed out Night to Be One is a money move. Um, and it really is a stunner. I mean, a very instructive move. Night to Be One. Um, she mentioned in the press conference that she believed that when Lei Ting Che played E5, she might have underestimated the strength of this move. So, what is this move and why is it so good? Well, the point is that after knight c3, this is the perfect construction for black. Remember earlier I said dual purpose moves? I mean, this is the ultimate dual purpose. And this is really the reason we talk about outpost knights. Because the knight is able to block this pawn from coming forward while simultaneously attacking the weakness on d5. And don't forget that when d5 goes, c4 might go. Um, Add to it that this knight on d4 is also an outpost and, well, you've got a recipe for an endgame masterpiece by the women's world champion and now the, the four-time women's world champion. Um, very nice, but the technique didn't end there, so let's take a look at a few more moves. Um, rook to d1, of course, kind of like eyeing the pawn. And now, after knight e2, or rook b3... I told you that that pawn on g4 would kind of give us options to get our king into better position before we make any other decisions. And now for f6, it's funny because I think at this point we were about to go on break and I was saying how I really didn't want to trade off a pair of rooks here because I felt like I have a rook and you have two rooks. I need a piece that moves like a rook to more easily win. I mean, for one thing... Two knights versus a king is only a draw. So too many trades leaves me with these ominous fears that I'll end up up two knights and still not able to win. But furthermore, it's about chess logic, right? When you have two of a thing, sometimes they become redundant. So we would prefer to keep one rook off, one rook on the board, rather than trade and let you be the only person who have rooks. You kind of see this idea echoed in other chess um, trades like two queens, for instance, are often not as good as you would imagine, right? So like, I don't feel like they're really worth like 18 points, even though, of course, that's a very rare end game. The big exception is, of course, the um, bishops, right? So the two bishops are famous because they work so well together. But remember, that's for a specific reason, because they're able to control every square on the board that way. Um, but this type of imbalance, you'll see it echoed in other positions. So white wants to take this pawn, but not trade rooks. How do you do it? Well, obviously you can't take d5 right away. Um, and if you play knight d5, rook d3 forces a trade of rooks. More difficult technical task. And so it's funny, I was trying to figure out how to take the pawn. I was looking at like rook d4. It was like trying to, doesn't matter though, because same thing, knight d5, there's going to be a rook d3. And somehow... It escaped me. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing because like once she plays it, it looks so simple. Rook c1. Just rook c1 with the idea of knight f4 and just taking the pawn. It's funny because like it, that does seem like a simple idea once you see it, right? If this was the a tactic on like chess.com or Puzzle Rush, I feel like it would be like one of the easier tactics because it's just one move, right? But it's not a really common pattern and it has something in common with that knight b1 move that you're kind of going backwards in order to go forward. And aggressive chess players like myself, those moves often escape us. So it's funny, like the great moves of this game, knight b1, rook c1, how to become a world champion by moving backwards. But hey, you know the cliche that you gotta move backwards in order to go forward. It's a cliche for a reason, right? So rook c1 and um, how marvelously her plan was executed. As now she does have that extra pawn, that extra protected, not protected pass pawn, but she has that beautiful pass pawn. And you see that c4 is not long for this world as the c4 pawn will be very difficult to protect. Um, in fact, it goes pretty soon. Uh, I did want to show you one more cool moment from this game. So Zhuan Jun is gearing up, lining up to use her two knights, her rook and her pawn to gain her that fourth women's world championship title. But hey, you always have to be vigilant. 
Now, if this was a blitz game, there's only one good move for black. You must play rook to c8 check. Quick, what do you do for white? Quick, quick, quick. If you say king d5 and Ju Wen Jun's fans do not like you very much because you just got mated randomly in the middle of the board. <laughs> I saw this variation in the analysis that I just started busting out laughing. I mean, it's, it's a really surprising variation. Like, how did that even happen? It looks like there should be some way out of this checkmate. This just doesn't even feel just. Tell me that you might not fall into this in a blitz game because I know you might. I might. Um, but of course that didn't happen. I mean, Lei Ting Chei didn't even try rook c8 check. Come on, come on, try rook c8. She played king e5 instead. And um, after that, unfortunately, her shot at the title wasn't long for this world. I really do kind of like the last couple moves though. Because one thing that you often notice about knights is that they can block a rook from defending the pass pawn. Well, I mean, almost any piece can do it. But I've seen it really kind of magically done with knight and it's in a lot of end games and even end game studies. And so here it's knight d6 check, stops this rook from defending the pawn, right? And then after king f4, um, knight b8 could stop the other rook, which is just kind of cool. As it turned out, Chu Wen Jun played rook b8 instead, which is equally as good, also completely winning. Um, you take. Knight takes b8, and we're about to make a queen. I mean, sure, you could try rook c3 check, but after king b4 or king b4, there's actually no more checks. And this queen is coming in just a move. And with that, Chu Wenjun won her fourth Women's World Championship title in epic style, a positional masterpiece. I got to tell you, if I saw this game when I was growing up and like trying to get better at chess, I think it would have made a big impact on me. And it has made a big impact on me just by calling it with Yovi and like analyzing it in more detail. Because chess is not just about beautiful tactics and sizzling openings. It's also about this deep understanding of what pieces you wanna trade, what you wanna do with the pieces, what squares you want. And in this game, Juwen Jun showed us how it's done Congratulations to the champ. The queen stays the queen, at least for now in the world of chess. Thanks for watching, everyone, and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.